Welcome once again, my friends, to our study tonight concerning the prophetic secrets of the New World Order. And we are learning a lot, aren't we? Amen. As we study the Bible and as we study current events, we begin to see things tying together in ways that we would have never recognized had we not been clued in by the Holy Spirit. So we want to invite His presence, and I'd like to invite you to bow with me in your heads as we pray. Father in heaven, thank you once again for the opportunity to fellowship in the Word of God and understand our times. We ask your Holy Spirit to teach us tonight and give us better insights and understanding so that we may put the pieces together and understand how to live in a globalized world under the new world order. We ask for your Holy Spirit's presence because we need Him and we desire Him in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, the title of this session is Europe, the Model of the New World Order. Europe, the Model of the New World Order. What is happening in Europe is a model for other places in the world. Now, modern globalization, as I mentioned, is rooted in one key principle, and that's the gradual merger of governments into one universal empire. And we merge we see the merging of politics and economy and culture and education, law and jurisprudence and all these other things. Europe is in the process of merging right now. So let's begin again with Revelation chapter 13. The aim and ultimate goal and purpose, as we know from Nebuchadnezzar's reign in Babylon, was global worship. In Revelation 13 verse 8, all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Is your name in the book of life, my friends? Amen. If it's not, you will worship, you'll collapse under the pressure, and you will come under the control of the new world order, and you'll come under the control of the new world order religion, which of course is going to be collaborating or or compatible with or controlled by all those things, the Roman Catholic Church. Sunday laws, Sunday worship, Sunday rest. By the way, while we're on this topic, I just should mention that there are four levels of Sunday laws. You may want to write these down. There are four levels of Sunday laws. Level one is Sunday closing laws where businesses, shops, industries, that sort of thing, they're closed on Sunday. L that's not a conscience law. You can collaborate with that law. Um, and as long as it doesn't violate your conscience, you know, it's, you, we are to support the laws of the land. Second level, which is more uh, advanced, is Sunday rest laws. Sunday rest where... People cannot do certain things on Sunday, such as mow the lawn, hang out the laundry, fix the deck or the windows on the house, or whatever, those sorts of things. And, uh, but, of course, sports and other types of act recreational activities, you know, those things are acceptable. Convenience stores and tourist areas and other, other places are, of course, um, open and available for access, but... It's a limited, very limited access. Uh, third level of Sunday laws is Sunday worship laws. This is where it becomes a conscience issue. The third level is Sunday worship laws. When they require by law that you worship on Sunday, Ellen White tells us that that is when it becomes the mark of the beast. Sunday's not, Sunday worship is not the mark of the beast right now. It is still a sin but it's not the mark of the beast. So those who are keeping Sunday and breaking the Sabbath, they still need to be enlightened about the, the truth of God, but it will rise to another level when it becomes the law of the land. All right, And the fourth level of Sunday laws are anti-Sabbath laws, which basically require people to break the Sabbath and work on the Sabbath instead of on all the other days, well, instead of Sunday, but like all the other days of the week. Anyway, that's the, that's the basis of Sunday laws. And as I have watched these things going 
uh, and, and developing in Europe and other places, I've noticed that there are, um, that there, there are these Sunday laws, these different levels. So Europe is in the process of merging right now on a regional level. Now the world is actually divided into ten regions. The Club of Rome identified those regions. These are regions that are naturally connected together by trade and commerce. Interesting, trade and commerce, remember that. They're, they're linked together by trade and commerce and some cultural things also, of course. Some are not as culturally connected, but, but there are still a lot of cultural links there as well. This regionalization is a step in the process towards globalization. It gets people used to a supernatural entity giving them laws and, and responding to those laws and, 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 and keeping those laws, uh, which basically subjugate the sovereignty of the nation on which they are citizens. Regionalization um, is divided up, as I said, into ten areas. Uh, I forget the number, the numbers of each of the areas, but you have Europe, you have North Africa and, and, and the Middle East, you have uh, Russia and the nations out that way, you have China, you have uh, the South Pacific, such as the islands around Australia or, or within range of Australia and New Zealand and those nations together out there. You have this, the Southeast Asian Union, you have the Northeast Asian group. Uh, they're not all unions and some of them are in various levels of growth. But we'll be talking about the foundations of these. Um, but these are some of the main uh, regions. Oh, by the way, there's also North America and there's South America and Central America. You have three different uh, regions there. We have the North American Union, which is slowly being constructed. So, um, keep in mind that no religious laws can be imposed worldwide under the current system. There has to be a change if we're going to see Revelation 13 fulfilled. Um, many people think that the European Union is the best example of the merger of international law so far. The super state based in Brussels increasingly controls every aspect of European life. How would you like to have a supranational organization controlling every aspect of your life? Well, it doesn't matter because it's going to happen sooner or later, so you better get used to it. And it's trawling through society little by little, all these controls, you see. It's trawling little at a time, farther and farther throughout society. But there's a hidden agenda, a secret side of Europe that will help us understand the real goals of the New World Order as well as Europe. Extremely interesting. Now, turn with me in your Bibles uh, to, well, we're in Revelation 13, are we not? I want you to notice it says, verse 2, the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth is the mouth of a lion, and the dragon gave him his power. Who's the dragon? Right. Satan. So Satan gave the papacy its power, and its seat, and great authority. And I saw one of his heads, as it were, wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed. Now that's talking about Europe. The deadly wound given to the papacy was when? 1798. Very good. When uh, Napoleon's uh, general Berthier took the pope and sent him in exile. Among other things, by the way, that was only one little thing. That, that was one aspect of it. There were many other things that happened also to crush the power of Rome at that time. But the Bible says its deadly wound was healed and then all the world wandered after the beast. So what this is saying is that the process of healing the deadly wound uh, will lead to all the world wandering after the beast. And that process is a, a fairly lengthy process. And when I see what's happening right now and how Rome is enormously popular, in spite of all the scandals of various types, both sexual and financial and other things, I am amazed at how 
Rome continues, nevertheless, to gain more power, more influence, and uh, continually advancing in these areas. This is talking about the healing of the deadly wound. And when Rome regains control of Europe, she will then be able to move out in other areas. She cannot do anything effectively until she regains control of Europe. So anytime there's an attempt for Rome to take on Europe, well, the angels hold back the winds of strife. I know why they're doing it, because the Bible tells us. For instance, Angela Merkel, the Chancellor of Germany, years ago, before the signing of the Lisbon Treaty, which is basically the constitution of the European Union, before the signing of the Treaty uh, of um, Lisbon, she was pushing very hard to include language in the treaty that identified the Catholic religion, or sorry, the Christian religion, which is Catholic in their thinking, the Christian religion as the historical heritage uh, of, of the religion of Europe, you know, the, the historical religion of Europe. She tried very hard, and I tracked that and watched that over those years. But she failed. I credit that failure to none other than the angels of God. That failure, and, and they used, of course, many different things. You know, there were a lot of secular reasons why the whole thing failed. There were a lot of practical reasons why the whole thing failed. There were even a lot of social reasons why the whole thing failed. But friends, if it weren't for the angels holding back the winds of strife, none of those things would have gotten in the way. So the time will come, my friends, when uh, that will change. But for now, the angels were holding back the winds of strife. And I say this because I want you to understand that when you watch developing issues in Bible prophecy, as they unfold, you can see some things moving forward, but other things get pushed back. That's, that's the angels working behind the scenes. Nothing can happen in Europe without the angels' authority and permission. And from the throne room in heaven, by the way, it's not just the angels, but from God Himself. Amen. No terrorist can blow up himself and kill other people without God's permission. How does God give permission? The angels step back and let Satan do his thing. You know, the enemy of all souls. But when the angels are pressing in, that Satan can't do a thing. He's stuck. Thank God that God is in control, not the devil. I thank God that Jesus Christ sustains His people and defends His church. And those things that are prophesied are not to cause us fear, but they are to cause us rejoicing because we are told to look up for your redemption draweth nigh. Aren't you thankful that we are nigh unto redemption? I praise God for the, for the nearness of the coming of Jesus. I don't know when it's going to be. I don't have any predictions. I've had people ask me that from time to time. But I tell you, my friends, it's got to be close. It has to be close. I don't know. The angels may have many more tools in their toolbox that they can use to hold back the winds of strife so that God's people can get ready. Look, folks, the bottom line is God is waiting for a people to be ready to meet Him. And the only way that's going to happen is when they stop sinning by the grace of Jesus Christ who lives in them. You see, the time of the Day of Atonement is all about preparing a people to stand in the sight of a holy God without a mediator. Now, what do you need a mediator for? Because you sin. The mediator mediates between you and God because of sin. Do you need a mediator if you don't sin? No. You still need a Savior because we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. But you don't need a mediator if you stop sinning. So Jesus can leave the most holy place when His people have gained the victory over their carnality, Amen. the carnal nature. May God help us, brothers and sisters. That's the reason the angels are holding back the winds of strife. If God was ready with His people and everybody had the the, the consecration and the dedication that is required of, of, of last generation, uh, a day of atonement living, the angels could wrap it up quickly. Jesus could leave the sanctuary and, and it would be a matter of days, perhaps, until we're on our way to heaven. 
Friends, I pray that I can be part of that group, as I'm sure you do as well. Well, today we're going to discuss the secret history of Europe, but I want to show you the effect of this on globalization. Most people think that Europe is a nice place to visit. Anybody ever been to Europe? Sure, a few of you have been. It's a nice place to visit, all right, but it's much more than that. It's the most advanced regional government in the world. And as I said, regionalism is a part of globalism. It's all about getting people used to supranational government and to a smooth transition, or to smooth the transition into global government. Here's a quote from Ellen White, Great Controversy, page 565 and 566. I thank God for Ellen White, and I don't apologize for using her in the pulpit. It says, but Romanism as a system is no more in harmony with the gospel of Christ now than in any former period in her history. The Protestant churches are in great darkness or they would discern the signs of the times. The Roman church is far reaching in her plans and modes of operation. She's employing every device to extend her influence and increase her power. Every device, friends, is no exceptions. That's an inclusive term. Every device. It's amazing, and you watch what Rome does. She's using a lot of devices, I can tell you. Yes, okay, let me read that again. She is employing every device to extend her influence and increase her power in preparation for a fierce and determined conflict to regain control of the world, to reestablish persecution, and to undo all that Protestantism has done. Catholicism is gaining ground on every side. See the increasing number of her churches and chapels in Protestant countries. Look at the popularity of her colleges and seminaries in America, including the Jesuit ones. Um, and also look at the growth of ritualism in England and the frequent defections of the ranks or to the ranks of the Catholics among the priests of, so, of the Anglican Church. These things should awaken the anxiety of all who prize the pure principles of the gospel. I want to just point out that it wasn't just in the mid-19th century when there were a lot of priests of the Anglican Church defecting over to Rome. It's happening now. Because of the big split in the Anglican Church over women's ordination and homosexual ordination to the priesthood, there are large groups of people, not only in England, but also in America and in other parts of the world, that no longer believe that they can continue to fellowship with the Anglican Church or its equivalent here in America, the Episcopalian Church. And so they have left that church in droves and gone to more conservative denominations of, of Anglicans or Episcopalians. And some of them have now gone back into the Roman Catholic Church. And the Catholic Church took advantage of this situation by opening up a special personal ordinariate under the, the Pope himself so that whole churches and whole groups of churches can come back into the Roman Catholic Church lock, stock, and barrel and still continue a lot of their Anglican rites and ceremonies and so on. That has been happening now over the last few years, five or six years, whatever it's been. So it's still a current issue. Rome is aiming to bring these churches back under her fellowship, under her control. And that is going on in a very friendly, ecumenical kind of way as well. Ellen White wrote that, before the, uh, that statement before the ecumenical movement began. Great Controversy was published the last time in 1911, meaning the last edition was 1911. The ecumenical movement didn't even begin till after Vatican II, which is in the late 60s or mid-60s. What would she say today? What would Ellen White say today if she saw what's actually happening today? Maybe she did see it in vision, I don't know. But she wrote this also, page 615 of Great Controversy. 
Romanism in the old world and apostate Protestantism in the new will pursue a similar course toward those who honor all the divine precepts. Well, the old world is Europe. Europe thank you. And Europe is in Rome's backyard. She will never be able to impose Sunday laws or any other sort of religious worship without getting her patrimony back. Europe was her patrimony for many years. When Europe allows Rome to control her, we will then see dramatic things going on in the rest of the world. We're already seeing dramatic things, brothers and sisters, going on in the rest of the world. Just look at the way the ecumenical movement has been marching across the globe. I find that absolutely um, fascinating, as well as compelling. In 2009, Europe became a super state with a centralized government based in Brussels, 2009, when the Treaty of Lisbon, or the Lisbon Treaty, was signed. But that was the result of a long process that goes all the way back to 1957, even before 1957. Any of you around in 1957? I was one year old. Back in 1957, they signed the Treaty of Rome, of all things. This, was, this treaty was instigated by the Roman Catholic Church. The European Union is a resurrection of the Holy Roman Empire, and that was their intention. They started with the Treaty of Rome, which was an, an economic or trade treaty between the European nations. But if you don't understand the Treaty of Rome, friends, at least basically, you won't understand how the EU relates to Revelation 13, 17, and 18. Revelation chapter 13, chapter 17, and chapter 18 engage at the level of the European Union. It goes beyond that, of course. There's much more in those chapters. It's, those chapters, as we already know, talk about globalization at a, at a very uh, significant level. But uh, Europe is intimately involved in that equation. If you are studying the Bible and you want to understand these things, you better understand a little history of Europe. So 1957, very important time. Um, Otto von Habsburg. Has anybody ever heard of Otto von Habsburg? Okay, Otto von Habsburg was, he's, he's no longer an is, he is a was, he was the last reigning monarch of the Holy Roman Empire. Very, very significant individual. He was very involved in 1957 and the Treaty of Rome. He has been in um, exile as the reigning monarch of the Holy Roman Empire, living in Austria. Um, he's buried, I think he's buried in Austria. I'm pretty sure he's buried in Austria. He made this comment. The European community is living largely by the heritage of the Holy Roman Empire. Though the great majority of the people who live by it don't know by what heritage they live. Did you get that? In other words, he's saying the European Union is all about the Holy Roman Empire or the resurrection of the Holy Roman Empire. The foundations of the European Union are rooted in the Holy Roman Empire. That is the Ro Holy Roman Empire of Charlemagne or Charles the Great. America magazine, a Jesuit publication, speaking of the first president of Europe right after the Lisbon Treaty was signed. That is the European Council President Herman Van Rompuy. Herman Van Rompuy was the European president right up until just this last year when there was an election, and it wasn't a public election, it was an election within the council itself to elect a new one because his term had ended and he could not renew his term. There's a limit like there is with the presidency of the United States, for instance. But anyway, Herman Van Rompuy was the president for a while, and the Jesuit magazine, America magazine, said of him. He is, in short, a bearer of the torch 
first lit by the Catholic architects of European unity, De Gasperi, Schumann, and Adenauer, who, like Van Rompuy, are all Christian Democrats, or were all Christian Democrats, for whom faith and Europe went together. In other words, the men who started the European Union, who founded it back in 1957, these were Roman Catholics who had a Roman Catholic vision for what Europe could become. The Holy Roman Empire once again. But Rome, by the way, let me just throw this in, Rome does not have its sights just merely on Europe. Rome has its sights on the whole world. She says, I sit a queen, the Bible says, and am no widow and shall see no sorrow. Now, I want you to note that it was a Jesuit magazine that said this, and it was their Catholic faith, they said, that led the founders to initiate European integration, or what is known today as the European Union. Herman Van Rompuy was trained by the Jesuits in Belgium and has a strong affinity or love for them. He said in one speech that he made, we are all Jesuits about the leaders of Europe. That's what he said. He said, we are all Jesuits, um, including himself, Mario Draghi, who I mentioned before, the president of the European Central Bank, Jean-Claude Juncker, who is now the president of the European Commission. These are the names he mentioned. Um, and Jose Manuel Barroso, who was the former, just recently re uh, retired from that position, the, of the president of the commission, which Juncker is now doing in his place. He said, it creates, the fact that they were all trained by the Jesuits, he says, it creates unbreakable ties. And so he added, there is a Jesuits international in Europe. I find that extremely interesting that he would make that open of a statement that tells you that the Jesuits are in control and they aren't afraid for it to be known. Let's come back to the founders for a minute of the European Union. Alcide de Gasperi, interesting character he was. He was the founder of the Italian Christian Democratic Party. When you hear the word Christian Democrat, what do you, th what do you know that, that to be? That's Roman Catholic. Christian, Roman Catholic. For a Europe to say Christian, it means Roman Catholic. Yes, there are Baptists and Seventh-day Adventists and other evangelicals in Europe, but when you talk about Christian in a legal sense or in a comprehensive sense in Europe, you're talking about Roman Catholicism. He was the founder of the Italian Christian Democratic Party. He was a key planner in the European community all the way back in 1956, 1955, and also, of course, a signer at 1957 um, of the Treaty of Rome. He was an organizer of the Council of Europe, which is basically the council that Herman Van Rompuy was in charge of. And now there's somebody else, as you'll see in a minute, that's now in charge of that because of the elections they just recently had. Um, he was president of the European Parliament in 1954. So he was very involved in establishing the European Union all the way back in the mid-1950s. The Vatican loved de Gasperi. They love him. They gave him what is known as the Karls Prize. That's the German word for the Charlemagne Award, the Karls Prize. Now, you need to understand this. It was 1952. The Karls Prize is awarded to the, by the city of Aachen, Aachen, uh, Germany. It's given to key people who work for an integrated Europe. Charlemagne's importance, the Karls Prize is the Charlemagne or the Char Charles the Great Prize. Charlemagne's importance to the Roman Catholic Church cannot be underestimated. I, I mentioned this in our last uh, study in which we discussed the foundation that he used, common currency, common military, and common religion to establish, of course, the Holy Roman Empire. He was the king of the Franks, actually, but um, his favorite palace was in Aachen, and he united Europe under the Roman Catholic religion. His predecessor was Clovis I. If any of you know your history, you'll know that Clovis I was king of the Franks that first sustained uh, the Catholic Church. His wife, uh, Clotilda, 
was a Roman Catholic and she convinced him to convert in 596, I think it was, he was baptized into the Catholic Church. And then five, uh, no, 496, pardon me, 496, he was baptized into the Catholic Church. And in 508, he defeated the Visigoths, which then uh, meant that the Catholic Church could develop itself in terms of temporal power. Aachen, as I said, was his favorite residence, and now it is the city that awards the Roman Catholic Karls Prize to those who are advocating and promoting uh, the European Union. And he got this Roman Catholic Award for his dedication to resurrecting the Holy Roman Empire. To be a recipient of the prestigious Karls Prize suggests strong sympathy with the idea of Europe again coming under the Roman Catholic Church. The Karls Prize was given recently to the following individuals. Angela Merkel, Chancellor of Germany. Bill Clinton, for whatever reason. Pope John Paul II. And even the Euro. Yes, the Euro shows the importance of a centralized economy to Rome's aims. To show papal appreciation, Di Gasperi was not buried in his hometown of Trentino, Italy, but under a Catholic basilica in Rome. And now they're working on making him a saint. A political leader. Not a, not a bishop, not a pope, but a political leader. They want to make him a saint. The second person, Robert Schumann. He was prime minister of France after the end of World War II, and he was one of the founders of the European Council, along with the Gasperi. He studied under the Jesuits in secondary school. Would that surprise you? He famously said, the European spirit signifies being conscious of belonging to a cultural family. Well, there's that word culture again. The cultural family. Our century that has witnessed the catastrophes resulting in unending clash of nationalities and nationalisms must attempt to succeed in reconciling nations in a supranational association. Other, in other words, a superstate. Note also that the cultural family <laughs> that he mentions, this includes, culture includes religion. So he's not leaving out the Roman Catholic religion by saying that. You know, he didn't mention Rome. But by saying cultural family, he's referring not only to religion, but other things as well, but especially religion. Schumann was given the Karl's Prize, of all things, for his effort to resurrect the Holy Roman Empire. The papacy was so pleased with him that they made him a papal knight of the order of Pope Pius IX. Now they have him on the track to sainthood as well. The third person was Konrad Adenauer, the four-term chancellor of Germany. Starting in 1949, he served after World War II. He was perhaps the most powerful influence on West Germany. Chairman, he was chairman of the Christian Democratic Party in 1950, which is the Roman Catholic Party, of course. Uh, he developed a social market economy. He was famous for this social market economy, which is a mix of capitalism and Roman Catholic social teaching. His policies laid the foundation to reunite East and West Germany, which is a vital ingredient for a revived Holy Roman Empire. You've got to bring the two Germanys back together. In the forefront, he was in the forefront of planning for the Treaty of Rome as well. In 1954, Adenauer also received, you guessed it, the Karls Prize for diligent efforts to restore the Holy Roman Empire. He was unconditionally committed to it. All three leaders, De Gasperi, Schumann, and Adenauer, had a vision for Europe that was essentially a Roman Catholic vision. To resurrect the Holy Roman Empire, Rome must have these kind of men at the helm. And they have continued to have these kind of men at the helm for quite some time. For all that time, in fact. These men were all involved in organizing the Treaty of Rome which was signed in 1957, and it established Europe, or the European Economic Community. Ever heard of the European Economic Community? What happened to it? It's gone now. It was morphed 
into the European community when it became more political. You see, back in 1957, they said, oh, it'll never become political. They promised it would never become political. They were lying through their teeth because that was the intention all along. And today, of course, it is a political entity. They said back then it was only a trade deal. Well, anybody who has a few neurons to rub together would know that a trade deal leads to economic deals, which leads to political deals. One thing leads to another. The economy, if you want to know where the political world is going, follow the money. If you want to know where the money's coming from or where the money's going, look where it's coming from. You see, in other words, the money right now is pushing this socialism, especially is it pushing the Holy Roman Empire back in Europe. Anyway, a super state has now emerged over Europe, the very thing they said would never happen. And why is that important? Without Europe under papal control, there is no way for Rome to get the rest of the world. Modern leaders of Europe have the same Roman Catholic vision, as the Jesuit magazine pointed out. Donald Tusk, who is president of the European Council, now under the new regime, is a Roman Catholic. He, is the, he started his political career as an activist in Poland during the Solidarity Movement. Anybody remember the Solidarity Movement leading up to the 1989 collapse of communism in Eastern Europe? Well, he was involved in it back then. So he's been around this concept of the Holy Roman Empire for a long time. And being a Roman Catholic, well, being from Poland, he's probably going to be a Roman Catholic because there's few, very few non-Catholics in Poland. Tusk later became Poland's longest serving prime minister since the fall of communism. In August of 2014, he was elected as president of the European Council. That was last year. Tusk was given the Karls Prize. Oh, ho, ho. Well, amazing. He was given the Karls Prize in 2010 for his efforts to unite Europe. Tusk last visited the Pope in private audience, he's done it a number of times, in May of 2014. So he's current and he's up to date on what's going on with the Vatican. Tusk is working diligently to resurrect the Holy Roman Empire. Jean-Claude Juncker, I mentioned him before, President of the European Commission, He's a Roman Catholic, was trained by the Jesuits, according to Herman Van Rompuy, and uh, was the f who is the former council president. Juncker is a financier and was for a time the minister of finance for the nation of Luxembourg. He eventually became prime minister of Luxembourg and was the longest serving head of any national EU government. And that was for 18 years. So if he's going to be in that kind of position for that long, you can be sure that he was promoting all the right things, namely European integration. In November, he, along with other presidents of the European Union institutions, met with Pope Francis in Strasbourg. You can be sure that uh, he will one day get the Karls Prize. During the European economic crisis, while he was still head of the European Central Bank, he said, and I quote, I mentioned this before, I am for secret, dark debates. When the going gets tough, you have to lie. And that's exactly what he did for many years. In other words, globalist leaders cannot be trusted to tell the truth. You know, maybe he's speaking for himself. But as a globalist leader, he has to be speaking for others too, after all. The whole very beginning of the European Union, or what today is the European Union, was based on a lie. They said, well, it'll never become political when they were intending that all along. So they all, you know, the politicians these days have to lie. That's the definition of a politician, in a way. Really. You know, they, they have to tell you what you want to hear, and then when they get into office, they do what they want to do. You see, they lie. And they have to lie to cover things up. They have to lie to protect themselves and their friends. You know, no political leader can be trusted to tell the truth. That's the nature of politics. And by the way, I'm not speaking, making a political speech tonight. I'm making a prophetic presentation, just so nobody gets confused about that. Then there's Mario Draghi, president of the European Central Bank. 
He's a Roman Catholic, as I mentioned, trained in Rome under the Jesuits in high school. He was trained at the Instituto Massimiliano Massimo, a Jesuit high school in Rome. He became an economist and a banker, and he began to think like Jesuits. You know, when you're trained by the Jesuits, you think like them, and they guide you and help you understand how to think in certain ways. Anyway, he became a, a banker, and he was governor of the Bank of Italy for six years. He became head of the European Central Bank in November of 2011. His predecessor, Jean-Claude Juncker, uh, sorry, Jean-Claude Trichet, received the Roman Catholic Karl's Prize. My guess is that he's in line for it, too. He'll probably get it in due time. Forbes magazine said he was the eighth most powerful person in the world and the, and the second world's greatest leader behind Tim Cook of Apple, of all things. For whatever it's worth. Anyway, he's quite a shrewd individual. The next person that I want to share with you about the European institutions is Martin Schultz. He's president of the European Parliament. Again, a Roman Catholic. He is the 2015 Carl's Prize recipient, which he received yesterday. Three months after becoming president of the EU Parliament, he was at the Vatican inviting the Pope, Pope Francis, to address the Parliament in Strasbourg. He received the gold medal from Jean Monnet Foundation for Europe. The gold medal is given to those who promote European unity. It's another award for promoting European unity. He got that in 2014. So he's right in there with them all. Uh, by the way, he was also given the key of honor to the city of Lisbon in 2013. So every year he's been getting special awards. 2013, Lisbon. 2014, the, uh, what do they call that? The gold medal from the Jean Monnet Foundation. And 2015, yesterday, he received the Carl's Prize. For Schultz, it's all about resurrecting the Holy Roman Empire. And he is very shrewd. Very friendly, but very shrewd. One more European leader that needs to be mentioned also is a woman perhaps the most powerful woman in all of Europe, and you probably guessed it already, Angela Merkel, the current and so far three-term chancellor of Germany. If she gets a fourth term, she'll be tied for the longest running chancellor in the history of Germany, of West Germany, or of Germany after World War II. She's the daughter of a Lutheran pastor, actually, but she's arguably, as I said, the most powerful woman in Europe. She has led Germany to the place where it dominates Euro politics and the EU economy. She received the Karls Prize in 2008. She, was, she has consulted with the Pope on numerous occasions. Merkel has worked hard to get European constitution to reference Christianity as the historical religion of Europe, which of course, as I mentioned before, did not work. There are other leaders of importance all throughout the European institutions, like Mario Monti, who was also Jesuit trained in Milan. He was first the Prime Minister of Italy, appointed during its economic crisis, recent, you know, the recent economic crisis. Um, and now he is a counselor to the European leaders of the various institutions, the, the, the main institutions of Europe. Um, he is an economist, and so he has a lot that he can offer to them, theoretically. And then there's Mariano Rajoy, also trained by the Jesuits, who is now the Prime Minister of Spain, one of the most important Catholic countries in history. Well, my friends, it sounds to me like things are pretty sewed up in Europe, don't you think? Notice that it all started with trade deal. And if it continues there will be more trade deals. And that's very important. Trade deals start the process of economic convergence, especially of nations that are involved in the deal. Today, there are many trade deals. Um, besides the EU, which started out as the European Economic Community and then became more, a little more political with the European Community, dropping the economic part so it's more comprehensive, 
And then it became just the EU, the European Union, which of course is a political as well as an economic entity. But there's also NAFTA. Have you ever heard of NAFTA? North American Free Trade uh, Authority or whatever they call it. And then there's CAFTA. You know what that is? Central American Free Trade Agreement. And then there is Mercosur. You know what Mercosur is? I bet you don't know what Mercosur is. That's a group of Latin American countries in South America that are bonding together in a trade deal which will inevitably lead to a political convergence. But in recent times we even have two more big deals that are working up in trade. One is called TAFTA. You know what TAFTA is? You see it's not just regions now. Now they want to start working on trade deals between regions in order to bring them closer together. TAFTA is the transatlantic free trade agreement. You see what's happening? And then there is, of course, uh, the TIP partnership, which is transatlantic trade and investment partnership. Those two things are working you know, together to sort out uh, what they can do with regard to um, trade tra across the Atlantic. And then most recently, some of you may have, may have heard about this, might have heard about this, is the uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership, or the TPP. Trans-Pacific Partnership. In other words, trying to get the North American entities uh, linked up with Pacific entities uh, over there in the Pacific Rim, where you get uh, China and Japan and Korea and Taiwan and a lot of other economic partners with the largest um, economy on the planet, the United States. These trade deals will lead to greater political unity and integration and they will also lead to a reduction in sovereignty as nations have to solve problems and they need a larger or a, or a higher entity to deal with those things. All these are laying the foundation for a economic convergence and eventually a political and religious convergence. They don't talk about religion right now because if they started talking about religion right now, they would get themselves in trouble and it would derail their projects. But that's in the back burner. Rome has it in the back burner for sure. And in fact, in Europe, she's pushing for um, what they call the European Sunday rest laws, which comes through uh, laws relating to workers. There is a policy of the European Union known as the time off from work policy. It gives people, it requires that workers, employees, be given time off from work each week. And it's a very interesting thing. They've been pushing this for a while and I've been tracking it. What they've done is they've taken the policy and they've tried to make it to say that time off from work must be primarily on Sunday. And the reason they say this is because families need family time together. That means they need coordinated time off from work. And the only day or the best day for that, of course, is Sunday. That's it. And you know what else they say? They say that Sunday is the best day to have off. Do you know why? For health and safety reasons. And they've even done studies to document that, it's, that Sunday as a day off is better for health and safety than any other day of the week off. They did studies on all the days and they, they looked at these and they said, okay, when there is a day off from work, how often do people miss work for health reasons? Absenteeism. Absenteeism goes down on Sunday. Or when they have Sunday off, I should say. Also, injuries and accidents go down when, when workers have Sunday off, and it's far better than Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, you see. It's a, the best day, they argue, for rest. Sunday. Well, they also did studies about Saturday. 
And it just happens, my friends, that Saturday edged out Sunday by a tiny margin as the best day off <laughs> from work. But of course, they ignore those studies because that's not a convenient day. Sunday is a convenient day, and since it just edge, is edged out just a little bit, they don't worry about that little edge. They're not going to make Saturday the day off from work, I can assure you. But that's how they argue. It's an extremely interesting process of what they're going through in Europe in order to promote Sunday rest. So it all started with a trade deal, and that's perhaps very, very important because trade deals start the process of economic convergence. Um, supernatural organizations are created to manage the convergence. The European Union has its organizations, the Council, the Parliament, and the Commission, so that they can manage the convergence of the economic and political entities of Europe, of all the nations, and reduce their... Basically, they want to make a federalization of Europe, uh, or the United States of Europe, if I may put it that way. And by the way, De Gasperi, Schumann, and Adenauer all knew all of this. They saw it all. They strategically organized it, and they strategized. They, they, they planned this, my friends. This is no accident. The European Union was no accident, and it will not be. As long as the angels of, of heaven hold back the winds of strife, it will be a long, slow process. But eventually, Europe developed its common currency and its political organizations. It's now developing its military. And when Germany develops a military, what does that, what does that tell you is going to happen? Another war. And are we told in the end of time that there will be wars and rumors of wars? Some big ones? Yes, we are. Last but not least, if there is a uh, political organization, there must be a way of enforcing political decisions, namely internationally across the nation states that are involved in this organization. Consequently, there needs to be a supranational judiciary and a supranational military or police to enforce this globalization or regionalization in the case of Europe. But ultimately, the same institutions will morph into global institutions and they'll serve in that capacity. So we have Interpol. Have you ever heard of Interpol? Interpol is an international police organization. And that's gradually getting more power as time goes on. I've been reading some articles about that recently, how that Interpol has been given more responsibility than it has in the past. Previously, it was sort of an innocuous uh, organization that was helping find criminals but could do nothing about them. The, the local entities would have to arrest the criminals, but they could help find them. But now they're taking on more, more responsibility. Anyway, as far as the EU is concerned, without a military, it will never be sustainable. Charlemagne knew that. And those who are receiving the Carl's Prize today, they know it too because they're following in the model of Charlemagne. So Germany, the dictator of the EU, is in the process of rearming and building its military right now. And, of course, they're being praised by other nations, including the United States and Japan, for doing this. Imagine the nation that caused two world wars and millions of lost lives is now redeveloping its strategic military industry and its weaponry. In fact, in recent times, they have called for a great increase in funding so that they can update all their military hardware and, and equipment and ammunition and all of that. Germany's Minister of Defense is a woman named Ursula von der Leyen, the first woman ever to hold the office of defense of all things. And she's very aggressive in building Germany's military. Von der Leyen could easily be the next chancellor of Germany after Merkel. She's an extremely popular politician. <clears throat> so, there are three main things that are needed to restore the Holy Roman Empire. What are they? A common currency, a common 
military, and a common religion. Historically, when Germany is divided, she is weak. It's always been that way. And whenever she's not united, she becomes very strong. She becomes a powerhouse. And when she's united, we can see that she has led in aggression in many, at many times in history. So we're seeing this develop right before our eyes. Should we not be concerned? Friends, this is telling us, this is one of the signs of the times. This is telling us that Jesus' coming is very soon. Amen. Gradually the world is moving in this direction, the globalization. And Germany is a classic example that we can watch to see how it's all being planned and all going to be developed. And it has been planned and organized by men and women who do not desire to be under God's principles. They want to be under Rome's principles. Rome makes them drunk. Rome makes them giddy. They think that if they reconstruct the Holy Roman Empire, they will succeed in governing the whole world eventually. Romans 17, uh, Revelation 17, pardon me, Revelation 17. We'll close with this. Verses 1 and 2, And there came one of the seven angels, which had seven vials, and talked with me, saying, Come hither, I will show thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth on many waters. That's Rome. With whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made, what? Drunk with the wine of her fornication. They stagger, my friends. They don't understand. The people don't understand what's happening to them. They see it, but they don't comprehend it. If you are a student of prophecy, brothers and sisters, you can comprehend it. It's not that difficult. The Bible gives a clear description and clear principles. So, spiritual Babylon is rising. Don't forget, the kings of the earth have an illicit, intimate relationship with the whore. It is a friendly relationship right now, but that will change when Rome is punished. Rome is waiting for her time. The Pope is already essentially the most popular person on the planet. The Vatican is actively urging these leaders of the world to organize for her own benefit. And I'll finish with this quote. Robert Mueller, Assistant Secretary General of the United Nations, for 40 years said, we must move as quickly as possible to the one world government, a one world religion under a one world leader. Father in heaven, we pray that you will make us understand more clearly how these things are unfolding in our time. Father, we pray that we may have a spiritual experience with Jesus Christ, that we may be totally consecrated to him that all these things, as they come to pass, will not cause us to fear, but will cause us to rejoice. And Father, may we lead others into the kingdom of heaven, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.